It is fantasy football go time, and we don't want you drafting guys who are going to be drafted lower next year. We want you getting the breakout players in the middle rounds of your draft, the guys that at the end of this year you're going to say, I want a championship because of those fantasy footballers, guys. You're welcome. Make sure you like this video. Subscribe. Please subscribe. Ring the bell. Leave your comments, and come with us on the ride for fantasy football this season. The time is coming swiftly. The middle rounds are now close for the unskilled. Yet here you are, unprepared, you fools. This season you will find all kinds of foes, eager to watch your draft crumble with wasted picks. There can only be one ultimate draft kit. Only one that can bend them to its will. And it does not share power. You must wield the UDK and send your opponents back to the shadows. You shall not pass. On this chance to send your league mates into the deep, fly you fools to ultimatedraftkit.com. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Tuesday. August 23rd, Mike Wright, Jason Moore, Andy Holloway, the Fantasy Footballers, back with you. The Deucers are here as well. Just deucing. The pro. The pro Deucers. Oh, yeah, they, they are. are. Professional at deucing. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> ah, yeah. ah. Ah. Welcome to Tuesday morning. Yes, breakout picks on today's show. We have a ton of consensus breakout picks in the Ultimate Draft Kit at ultimatedraftkit.com, but today we're going to each uh, bring you one more from kind of our individual list, players that we're looking at as breakout candidates for the year. The, this lineup of shows here, breakouts today, sleepers tomorrow, busts and values uh, the following day. It's, it's really fun because with, with the Draft Kit, we put our heads together and and at least two of the three of us completely agree, and we are aligned when we have those guys highlighted. And in usually the draft all three. Yeah, yeah, usually all three. Uh, and so these these shows are. This is the chance for us to get that player in there who may, maybe there was not an agreement on it, but you still like you have the conviction. You want to voice your opinion. See if we can sway the other people mm -hmm. into the into, into believing our take. I mean, I, I I'm gonna admit something. I'm I'm open to being swayed. Okay, sure. All right. Uh, if I have a differing opinion, I'm open to being swayed, and that is uh, that's the fun, right? It's predicting what's going to happen and uh, the situation. Well, in specific on today's show, the breakouts. These are the ones that win fantasy champions. You know, you you, you championships. You get these right, and you know, I I I've brought this up a few times over the course of this last few months. You look at last year's champion in your league. Go look at your league and who was a champion. They've got a couple players that were true breakouts. Yep. So we'll talk about those on today's show. Some news to talk about. Quick question about the Broncos. The Let's Ride edition of the quick question. Before we kick it off, a couple of quick reminders. The first one, I just want to mention this to everybody listening. Uh, this show is... Uh, a free podcast. We we do it five days a week throughout the entire season. If you want to help the show out and do it in less than like one second. Oh, man. Sounds easy. Uh, <laughs> please follow or subscribe the show on whatever platform you're listening on. So uh, it is a plus button in the upper right on Apple Podcasts. It is a follow button on Spotify. It is a subscribe button on YouTube if you watch the show. But that's a, a simple way you can help us and help yourself because then you'll get the newest episodes for free right in your podcast player. 
Um, if you want notifications, you can click those uh, bells in the different places, and they'll let you know when we're going live. Mike does a Sunday live stream every single week during the year. Indeed. Uh, we do some pop-ins from time to time, some live events, and then obviously the episodes. So that is one quick and easy way to just, help the show out. Just tap subscribe. <laughs> just tap, just it, tap in. it in. Uh, and then yesterday we made the big announcement. Oh, yes. Over 5,500 in there so far in one day. Megalobowl.com. I am awake. It is growing. <laughs> Yes, I am. <laughs> and you go to megalobowl.com, and you can uh, you can also find it on the website, thefantasyfootballers.com. But just go in there, find out the details, join a league, pick your draft time. It's the largest fantasy football league uh, in, in the universe. And the winner gets into the listener league with the three of us next year. Yeah, so uh, it, it's so much fun. We put all the standings up on the website. It's just a great competition of skill and might and all of those things <laughs> yeah you know brick breaking <laughs> i'm just you know maybe i'm a little inspired by um you know gandalf opening the show I, and I, the I new gotcha. the new uh lord of the rings television show trailer came out so maybe i'm speaking like a dwarf a little bit okay uh quick question today which broncos player are you most likely to draft at their current average draft position let me read them out to you javante williams going in the Late second, 12th pick of the second round. Cortland Sutton, Mike's my guy in the fifth round. Jerry Judy, also in the fifth round. Both of them like two picks apart. Russell Wilson. Russell? Unlimited. Wilson. Se seventh round pick. Melvin Gordon in the ninth. And then Albert Aguevinam in the 11th. Um, I have my first and second place. Oh, man. This, this is tough because the answer is all of them. Like, <laughs> yeah, I like... Even I, even Albert? So, Albert O, in the double-digit round... I'm Albert I out. I, I'm, not, I'm not big on Albert O compared to all the other tight ends that I have on my... You know, when, when I get to the last couple rounds, I, there's about three or four guys that are always there that I will take over Albert O, but it's not like he costs you much in the 11th. Every other player, Melvin Gordon is a steal. Mm -hmm. Russell Wilson is the last elite quarterback that... Uh, is being drafted that you're confident is elite. Judy Sutton are great, but my my pick would be Javante. Yeah, Javante is my pick. Russ, a close second. I am perfectly fine with Javante Williams' uh, draft price. I mean, a uh, best ball right now, I just took him at the 2-5. Uh, so I'm perfectly fine with that. But you know what's my guy, Cortland Sutton. In, in the fifth round, to get – to to me, what is such a discount in in my projections is a wide receiver one in the fifth round is it's outrageous value. So Cortland Sutton all day. If you drafted Javante, are you willing to go back to the uh <laughs> Mile High City and right. draft Sutton, Judy, or Gordon? So that's why my answer was Javante because he he comes up first. And I find that when I have drafted him there's a lot of pivot options off of most of those other players, and I find myself not wanting to double up. Now, I'll grab Russell Wilson and Javante and have that kind of quarterback running back stack, but I don't tend to grab Sutton or Judy if I, if I did the late second round investment in Javante. News and notes from around the league. All right. We'll catch you up on what's happening. Josh Palmer's in the concussion protocol. Has looked outstanding in the preseason. Uh, should be all right, but we'll monitor. Isaiah Spiller, running back, rookie, Chargers. Not good vibes right now. Week to week with an ankle injury. Uh, head coach came out and said he probably is going to miss week one. And then we've heard Joshua Kelly's kind of the, the locked-in backup, also known as Eckler is is – Good to go. Back to business. What yeah, back I, to business. Yeah. That's right. What Isaiah Spiller has done this offseason because he was drafted, and that kind of uh, scared me a little bit for Austin Eckler, just having another big-bodied, capable running back. But he has not established himself at all in this camp. He never became the clear-cut backup. Now he's missing, probably missing week one. I agree with you guys. It's, it's really just pro-Austin Eckler. Jason, I'm going to ask your opinion here, but uh, Juju Smith-Schuster has missed another practice on Monday with a knee injury. Well, is it's this, not is great. It, is there an alert <laughs> button in your future? 
Uh, Do you there, want it? There's more of a sadness button. I don't think it's a red alert situation where I'm off. It's yeah. It's like oh man. It's like Juju, man. You're so young. You're you're 25. I thought like I thought this was your chance to 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 Cooper Cup this thing and get a quarterback upgrade and it still can be. You still can, but he, if he's getting his knee drained and getting shots and missing, maybe his knee is much older. That's what it feels like. It feels right, it's like, like a girly knee. He's got some arthritis in the knee, um, like Todd Gurley. Yeah, right. to be clear. Oh, yeah, we, the, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> yes. The the idea of having to get your knee drained, and I, I know this. It's not like an uncommon thing in the world of athletics, but Any, it's, anybody it's in this so room, gross. Anybody man. in this room with a knee drain? Jay, Papa, yeah. Papa, yeah, Papa Josh, Josh has had a knee drain. Not surprising. Papa Josh has sustained many injuries. Papa Josh has no ACL left. <laughs> yeah. He just said, man, <laughs> I don't need to fix that. Um, but Juju missing practice again. If you're drafting, does it change your view of that pick? Uh, I have I have since the since he started missing practice, missed the preseason game with the knee injury. I've been on the clock staring down him and others. And it's not that he's off my board at all. Not not in any way, shape, or form. I think he's going to be one of the two starters on a great offense, but it has made me oftentimes tie-break a similar tiered player with someone else. It also, uh, similar to how Isaiah Spiller affects Austin Eckler, gives me a little bit more confidence in the season-long outlook of Sky Moore as the you know, MVS been there, done that. Really, it it does it. The, the preseason, the way things that have happened in the preseason, because that I'm shooketh for Sky Moore still being down on the on the depth chart. I would not have expected Sky Moore to be in two wide receiver sets in the preseason. That wasn't really no, but playing behind Justin Watson. Well, he's a superstar. I understand is no, I he it, is not a superstar. I don't know if we'll he's ever, a dude. I don't know if we'll ever do it as like a quick question or like segment on an episode soon but there are players that have narratives that were written in in may and june that i am being you know you get moved and mvs's situation is one that i am more moved on where i wasn't at, like jason said sky more for me it's mvs that i get more confidence with in sure. that situation uh mike evans returned to practice with the hand uh from the hamstring injury Irv Smith returned to practice on Monday, okay. has been out since the first week of August following thumb surgery. Come on, Irv. Stay healthy. And uh, the Raiders are expected to release running back Kenyon Drake. I got a Drake, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a Drake. Uh, I, I don't. I mean, the question of where he could land, I don't care. Yeah. Is that a fair enough answer? I Kenyon Drake is done. I think that his time in the NFL is coming to a close. Yeah, we've you know I mean? seen this this before. Yeah, I, I I pretty much don't care. There could be a situation, you know, if if Dobbins has a setback or something and they, you know, Baltimore brings him in and what, they, if, what if uh, he goes back to Arizona? That'll just be to hurt James Conner <laughs> and me. <laughs> yeah, I I doubt they re-roll, but maybe on a free contract sort of thing. Uh any other news? that you guys have back there a uh, quick reminder for those of you starting leagues getting things in order um go to fantasychamps.com if you need a trophy a belt a ring anything of that uh the awards right that mm -hmm. that make a league fun the trophies that you hand out uh we we obviously have them in our leagues we have some like the rings we do for individual titles and then we pass around a big trophy that goes to the the winner. I feel like if you don't have a trophy, you don't have a champion. I mean, you're you're missing out. Yeah, you're, you're definitely missing out. There's well, a at least lot some of fun. Swag, you I know, mean, a belt like, or a ring or getting to, you know, I mean, Stanley Cup. It essentially, like, if you get the trophy, mm -hmm. you, whatever whatever you say goes for the trophy. Like, you wanna you wanna bring that thing on vacation? Oh, that Go was to the beach. That was one of my uh, Go to most... Disneyland Jason style. <laughs> yeah, I brought that trophy to Disneyland, took pictures with it everywhere, had princesses holding it. It was a good time. I, I feel like it would be fun to like have a league that has to go to the ice rink <laughs> and watch the guy that won it put on ice skates and ride around the <laughs> rink with the trophy. Right. Like that would be pretty fun. All right, let's jump into breakouts. Breakouts.
this show did have some names that emerged last year that ended up actually breaking out and having some success. We did it. <laughs> we had uh, Deontay Johnson was uh, a name brought up on last year's show. Damian Harris, Michael Pittman, all of them with this city. pretty nice breakout seasons. But we're each going to bring forth a name. I, I want this to be a discussion. So if you guys have conflicting thoughts and opinions, please tell me your fears about these players, right? Because at, at some point, you know, if they were locks, if they were guarantees, they wouldn't be on the show, right? right. Yeah. The Jonathan Taylor <laughs> yeah, so, breakout. And this one's kind of in the lower hanging breakout fruit category, but I want to give you draft day confidence on this player to press the button because I know that me personally. I have not had it. You haven't pressed like, the button on this player? Yeah, I mean, I've in all the drafts where, like, I'm slotted in this player's area. I I don't think I have a single draft this year where he's on my team. There you go. And I'm talking about the wide receiver one for the number one scoring team in football last year, C.D. Lamb, wide receiver of the Dallas Cowboys. This is the confidence boost I want to give you and myself, I will say. I'll be speaking to myself uh, as I have yet to press that button. Because we really haven't seen a breakout campaign from C.D. Lamb, even though he's being drafted somewhere in the wide receiver seven, eight, nine range, we have yet to see that materialize in a way that has been a difference maker for fantasy football players. But let me begin with what the sports books have down for C.D. Lamb. The props right now are 90.5 receptions, 1175 yards, and seven and a half receiving touchdowns. So. Those numbers are sitting there as kind of that baseline expectation for C.D. Lamb. Those numbers, if he doesn't surpass any of them, puts him at around wide receiver 11 in half point scoring last year. So the market is saying he's being viewed as an elite wide receiver with his median outcome of those numbers that I just gave you. The one thing that I think was most impactful persuading me that C.D. Lamb is a confirmed breakout is the fact that all three of us in the UDK, we expect him to be over 135 targets. And since 2012, so you're going 10 years back, if you were a first-round wide receiver going into your third year like CeeDee Lamb is, and you get over that 135 target mark we all have him projected to get, they basically always beat their ADP. Or meet it if it's super high. And you look back, Des Bryant, Demarius Thomas, A.J. Green, DeAndre Hopkins, Mike Evans, Odell Beckham, Calvin Ridley, Hollywood Brown. They all beat their ADP going into year three, getting 135 targets. The only two that didn't, A.J. Green was ADP of three, ended at four. What a loser. Uh, and then Beckham, ADP of three, ended at four. Other ones, you know, Dez went from 13 to five, 21 to three for uh, Demarius Thomas. Hopkins, 13 to four. So... You have this like statistical backing now with C.D. Lamb that kind of makes him very safe with upside, in my opinion. What if he gets to 10 touchdowns? What if he catches 100 passes? What if he gets to 1,300, 1,400 yards? You do have top five potential with C.D. Lamb, and you have this first-round pedigree, historical data that says those are studs. He was drafted and hasn't shown it yet, but this is year three. Year two is kind of the rise. Year three is the ceiling, generally, in fantasy football when you see these wide receivers. So, um, you know, what if you end up with a C.D. Lamb that is a perennial top five type of wide receiver like Hopkins, and you're just a year ahead? Yeah, I mean, that's what we usually are in our my guys. He was a my guy last <laughs> year, so that would, be, that would be fantastic. My only worry here, um, because I, I love CD. I'm really hopeful. I just drafted him again in a, in a dynasty startup. I have him in, uh, you know, per, I, I think I literally have him in every single dynasty league that I'm playing in right now. Um, my worry, hey, you have a lot of CD. I do. And so I have a lot of worry <laughs> just because eggs are in a basket. Yeah. Uh, as they say. And my worry is that, you know, th this list of players who get 135 plus targets is great, but most of them. Uh, that that threshold is crushed. Um, you know, I think they average about 160 targets. Now he that's should, true. He should get 160 targets. He should. He really should. There's no one else on this team. But I just worry the system and the history of Dak. Like the one player in that list that you mentioned, 
who's in the 130s over 135, is Des Bryant with Dak. Now, he was a top five fantasy finish. So, uh, it, the well, that probably wasn't Dak then either. Uh, in I mean, 2012, I uh, there's no way. No, but Des Bryant also yeah, had 136 rumble. targets with um, with with Dak. Dak, and that was his highest wide receiver one target. So my only yeah word to your is, point, AJ Green 178 targets, Hopkins 192, Evans 173, Beckham 169. So, and he can get there. Yeah, and and I think part of that has to be some regression by the Dallas defense because they scored so many points and took the offense off the field. That's you know, that'd be the storyline of how that happens is their defense isn't as uh, impactful on the scoring side of things. Yeah, certainly. I, I think that but, uh, I I really hope he dominates targets and that it's not a system that is, you know, spreading the ball around the way that we've seen for the last, like, four or five years. Hyper target the man. He's so talented. For me, the, the issue with CD, like right now I have him at wide receiver eight, which – I mean that's that's a high end wide receiver one that I that I want who has the the ceiling that I do believe in so you know like I'm not projecting the full upside of CD Lamb in in my stats the hardest part for me though is the ADP like where he is where he is going in ADP like the the sandwich that he's in like he's surrounded by Aaron Jones Debo Mark Andrews if you want to go with with the higher end tight end it's he just the players going right around him are the ones that have prevented me from going CD Lamb. Uh, so I just I don't have the exposure, and it's, it's so that's why I find it so difficult to to get him on my rosters when I love the other players around him. Now in auction league, of course, very different. You get whoever you want, but in our in our snake drafts, well, I, I, I think just, I can't do it. No, I or haven't been able. It to makes do it. sense, but I it is a good point in the show to remind people that even though we talk about these players with very static average draft positions while we're bringing this up you know there's going to be a lot of leagues where Debo and Aaron Jones go ahead of CeeDee Lamb sure and those are the leagues where you're looking at it and you're saying instead you're looking at it and you're saying do I go Mike Evans or do I go to a CeeDee Lamb a mm -hmm. player that you know has done it or a player that you hope does it and that's where I think um, we need to have a little bit of confidence in this offense and in Dak and in the target totals with the potential of getting up there, because what if it's 150, 160? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good comparison of, like, if you're on the clock and it's between Mike Evans and CeeDee Lamb, do you go with Old Faithful or New Hotness? And there you I, go. I think I lean New Hotness. Speaking of New Hotness, Jason, let's talk about your breakout. Oh, baby, it's time. It's the guy I love so much, Brees Hall. Oh, go Brees Lightning. Why'd you turn into to Riley there? I, I, I just let my <laughs> you inner self out. knew it would happen. <laughs> All right, so I want to I talk about two simple things with Brees Hall. Brees Hall, the prospect, and Brees Hall's prospects. First. Wordsmith. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Brees Hall <laughs> is an elite prospect. We haven't seen him on the field. He hasn't been, you know, playing NFL well, ball we yet. We saw him yesterday. But. Well, we saw him with a backup <laughs> offensive line yesterday. Um, but as a college prospect, he is elite. He is not good. He's not like, oh, this is a good running back. This is a guy who could really do something. This is an elite, rare athlete. Athletically, there's only 14 guys that I can find in my data who have, have 215 pounds on a sub-4-4 four four in the history of my combine data. It is the rare of the rare athlete, and those who are drafted highly are great. Last two guys we've seen who hit those marks – Antonio Gibson and Jonathan Taylor. Those guys have done nothing but be running back one so far in their career. Uh, in Rotoviz's database, he's 95th percentile in speed, 94th in explosion, 94th in vertical. His freak score is 95th percentile. He is a different caliber of human, a la a Jonathan Taylor. But not every great athlete is great at football. And that's where you look at his production. Well, how was his college production? It was off the charts. Of all running backs drafted in the first two rounds of the NFL draft since 2007, Hall has the highest career rushing yard market share, the highest rushing t touchdown market share, and he's an early declare, which is another huge benefit yeah, for need prospects. That. You need to be an early declare, um, much higher success rate. Over the last decade, you look at his production as an early declare, here are the running backs who've had 40-plus rushing touchdowns and 80-plus receptions in college as an early declare. Saquon Barkley. Dalvin Cook and Brees Hall. That's it. 
uh, 50 plus rushing touchdowns and 4,500 scrimmage yards mar marks that Brees Hall hit. Jonathan Taylor, Jay Ajayi, and Brees Hall. That's it. This is not a good prospect. This is an elite, great physical athlete with elite, great college production. So now we know that. We know he is a special, different caliber of human being. But what are his prospects coming into this year? Because in 2022, plays for the Jets. Here's the downside argument, right? We don't know his utilization. We don't. He might not get enough work. He might not be the third down back and might not catch balls even though he did that in college. He might be the backup to Michael Carter, who was an impressive rookie last year in his own right. All those things could be true. But those unknowns are why Brees Hall is being drafted in the fourth round. Brees Hall will not be a fourth round draft pick again until he is at the end of his career I'll tell you that right now unless he gets catastrophically injured his draft price is going to go up and up and up over the next few years the unknowns don't mean that they aren't going to happen we don't know his utilization it doesn't mean he's not going to get utilized we don't know that he won't play behind Michael Carter that doesn't mean he's not going to play ahead of Michael Carter it just means we haven't seen it yet and Michael Carter is a good back but he is not in the same class of athlete or human that Brees Hall is I don't want to take anything away from Michael Carter here's the situation that I want to point to light I think this situation is almost identical to Jonathan Taylor and it sounds weird now going into year three when Jonathan Taylor is the 101 but this is a first round graded running back who fell into the second round their team who had him as a first rounder trades up in the second to go get him but we don't draft him in fantasy in those first few rounds because we're we're afraid of the other average to above average running backs on the roster. And I want to remind us, here are, here's a quote. I, I have a ton of them, but I don't want to take up time. So I'm going to read one quote from Jonathan Taylor's rookie year about Naeem Hines. This was in May. Coach Frank Reich said, quote, it wouldn't surprise me if there's a game this season that Naeem Hines has 10 catches. Naeem will be very much integrated into the game plan on all three downs. Still enough snaps for him to be very, very productive this year very productive, end quote. And he was. He was the number one waiver wire pickup that year in week one. He did. Frank Reich wasn't even lying. He had a game where he had 10 catches. But he's not the same caliber or class of an athlete or as a running back as Jonathan Taylor. So when push came to shove as the season went along, Jonathan Taylor got the job because he's the dude. He's a superstar prospect. That's what Brees Hall is. That's why they drafted him high, trading up in the second round. And Michael Carter is not going to keep him on the back burner. I don't necessarily think that Brees Hall is going to come out and have Brees Lightning week one, week two, Brees week three. Brees Lightning. Go Brees Lightning. <laughs> but I do think at the end of this year, he's going to win people championships. Uh, Jonathan Taylor, by the end of his rookie year, was a top 10 running back in fantasy football and won people fantasy championships. He will break out. And next year? He will not be in the fourth round. He will be at least a second round pick. Mike, do you have any thoughts on Brees Hall? The I'm with Jason that he's an incredibly impressive running back in college, and I'm trying to think back. I don't have the number right in front of me, uh, but the, uh, the 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 percentage chance of second round running backs beating out the starter by the end of the year for fantasy football because if, if Michael Carter is truly the concern, because uh, I I pulled all these numbers last year for for Javante Williams and it was it was it was over 60 percent of the time that that the rookie is the one finishing higher uh in total fantasy points at the end of the year now what does that mean for the Jets that's the biggest question mark I agree the peripheral pieces like he basically he has to be Jonathan Taylor that narrative story not the other second round running backs from the last five years. Well, because Taylor's the only one that's been in the top fifteen at the end of the season. The rest of them, it's a less than fifty percent chance they're even top twenty. And he's being drafted at RB nineteen. So I think that, you know, I worry about a shaky offensive line in New York. I worry about Joe Flacco and whatever this offense is going to provide. I worry about a really brutal beginning of season schedule yeah that that part sucks. it's like you know we talk a lot about would you invest in deandre hopkins at his adp for missing the first six games it's like i don't disagree that uh, with a couple big points that jason made number one this is the l furthest back you're going to probably draft Brees hall for the rest of his career uh relevant years 
That's for sure. Because I, to me, I look at Brees Hall, the breakout story, and I think it's, I think it's more next year than it is this year. Um, so I think he's drafted higher. And then the other part is, I think he can win people fantasy championships. It's just I don't know how to navigate the first eight to ten weeks if it's going to be. I mean, this is this is Mike Lafleur. This is RBBC historical. This is you know I've got all these Pokemon I want to pull out yeah. and use, and I think the superior athlete will win out. But I don't know if he can do it in New York with this shaky O line and injuries and Zach Wilson transition halfway through the year. Like those are my. How do you draft Brees Hall if you think he's good from week nine on, for example? Like, how do sure, I do yeah. that as a fantasy player, which is one of the reasons why I'm more hesitant. So, well, the, the number was uh, – so combos of running backs where the rookie uh, received a touch in at least 10 games. So, you know, like you're weeding out guys who just didn't play, guys who got hurt. But So when the rookie was active in 10 games, the veteran only beat out the rookie – Four of 19 times, 19 instances where that has happened for the second round. Rookie. And I, I would argue that the the further and further we get into NFL history, like the closer to today, Brees Hall was the first running back taken. Like it yeah. was the second round, but people don't go top five, top 10 running backs anymore. The NFL's caught up to like, oh, we don't need to pay these guys a ton of money. That doesn't help. We, we got Saquon. We got Christian McCaffrey. We got these great backs and they all went to bad teams who stayed bad. Um, so I, I think that... Uh, his draft capital is very, very good. And the O-line, PFF right now, um, has the O-line for the Jets as the 13th best O-line this year, and they just signed a new... Uh, that was pre-Becton, though. I did look that up. It pre was pre-Becton injury. But also pre... Uh, who, who is it they signed? Dwayne Brown? Yeah, Dwayne Brown, uh, big money contract just after the Becton injury, um, whereas the Colts line right now is, I believe, ranked number 10. Yeah, it's it's hard. It's a hard nav. It's more of a harder draft navigation. Not not a lack of confidence in Brees Hall, the player. You know, it's like DeAndre Swift, Joe Mixon. You know, these guys are superstar athletes, but their rookie seasons weren't Jonathan Taylor. Um, that's where it's like you know you're making a bet, right? And you, yes. And and I am scared to bet on the Jets personally, but the athlete himself. I mean, we've seen in camp that he's, you know, he's a different caliber than Carter. And to be clear. None of my hesitation on Brees believes that Carter will have a better fantasy season than Brees Hall. I don't think that's going to be possible, but I've heard, you know, in camp, they're saying Michael Carter is a much better pass protector right now. At this stage of his career, that could keep Brees off the field too. The, the, the final thing I'll say is Brees is in the running back dead zone where generally I don't want running backs. A few emerge every year because that's just how, how things work out for fantasy football. But if you're going to make a bet in the dead zone, bet on you. Bet on a rookie. Bet on bet yeah, on you and sure. bet on upside. Don't take don't take seasoned veterans in the dead zone. It, it, that doesn't work if out. If Brees was drafted to a better situation, this would be Clyde Edwards Alaire type of draft capital you'd be spending. So you're getting a Jets discount. That's being yeah, built in. That's true. It would have been the same if he went to Houston. You would have been going, uh, what do I do? So that that's built in where you know, I think we all have Brees around nineteen twenty as a fantasy finish, and but that might betray the fact that he could be top ten in the back half of the year or something yes. like that. All right, quick break, and then guess what? More Jets. All right, Mike is going to share his breakout. Um, by the way, do you a little point of trivia for you? Do you know the last Jets running back to finish top fifteen? You remember who that, that was? Uh, Iver Chris Ivory. It was Chris oh, Ivory. I loved yeah. Chris Ivory. Twenty seventeen. Chris Ivory. That dude was a man. Yeah. He ran. Um. He ran ferociously. He, he, he didn't run angry. He ran furious. Yeah. The Thomas Rawls level yes. of uh of of running style. Which, by the way, I think Damian Pierce has that too. Um. Mike, who is your breakout pick for today's show? All right. What can possibly go wrong on a breakout show? When two-thirds of these players are on the New York Jets. I'm Nothing! So, I'm so happy I'm not with you guys. <laughs> uh, my breakout pick, it's Elijah Moore. Second-year wide receiver for the New York Jets, who was fantastic. A second-round pick just a year ago. Finishes the year you know, with, with 43 over 500 yards and, and five touchdowns because the guy was hurt for quite a lot of the season. Now... I have been I've been hesitant and scared of Elijah Moore for 
on both sides of the argument of uh, saying, well, oh, he's on the Jets. I don't think Zach Wilson is a good quarterback. What like Can he really repeat what he did last year? And then on the other side, he's insanely talented. The guy is so smooth running those routes. He has fantastic hands. From weeks 9 through 13 last year, he was the wide receiver two in fantasy football. He was dominating when he was the wide receiver one, 21, three, wide receiver 39, nine, and then unfortunately had the injury that, that took him out for the rest of the year. And one of my arguments for when you bring up those numbers is, well, Zach Wilson wasn't really the quarterback when, when, when those things were going on, but I'm going to bet on the talent of Elijah Moore. He, uh, for, since 2014, rookie wide receivers drafted in the first three rounds. If they hit the target share that Elijah Moore hit, which was 18.5 when he's playing, they at least maintained that going into the next year. And you're not, he's not an outrageous draft pick, Elijah Moore. Like he's not going in the fifth round. He's, he's down there, you know, in your home leagues, probably going to go late seventh, early eighth round. You have Joe Flacco talking about him saying Elijah Moore reminds the, the, the explosiveness reminds him of Steve Smith. And I don't think that's an egregious thing to say. I can, I can see it. Watching young Elijah Moore, like he's he separates. He's always open. He was targeted on twenty four percent of his routes. That is an that is an absolutely outrageous number for for a a wide receiver to hit, for a rookie wide receiver to hit. And I want to point people to to uh, Amon Ross St. Brown, who is a good wide receiver, had that massive breakout at the end of the year. Like Amon Ra was, for fantasy purposes, useless Go, and, until the week 13 breakout where he had the, the, the six-week stretch where he won people fantasy championships. I totally understand the context that the impact of that is much stronger. The Elijah Moore run was five weeks. Like just not in the it, same It wasn't at the exact same time. It was in the middle. So you're like, well, and he's on the they're both on bad teams. What do you what Are do you, you really that much more confident in Jared Goff than than he, Joe, the combo of Joe Flacco and Zach Wilson? Uh, to me, these guys are in are in very similar situations. Both had very similar breakouts. And Elijah Moore is going two rounds after Amon Ross St. Brown. And this, this is not a knock on St. Brown at his draft price. I'm saying it's crazy. What if it's an either or? If you have to pick between the two of them? Sixth round Amon Ra, eighth round, early eighth uh, Elijah Moore at, at draft cost. Sure. Are you making the Elijah Moore decision here? If if it's, if it's it is just a heads-up situation, I'm going to go with Amon Ra. But I I think that both of them are great draft picks. We want – you want to target second-year wide receivers because these are the guys who go later on in the draft. You know, sixth round is not a really high draft pick, and eighth round is definitely not a high draft pick. And these are the guys who can really break out, make a huge impact on your roster, and and catapult your team. Because they, the reason that they go there is you just, you're not 100% sure that they're yeah. truly that great. Can they really get things done? We make all these arguments of well here's why they probably can't do it here's why they did it last year so but second year players like we said the, that's when the breakout happens maybe it's not their true ceiling yet but it is the breakout and to get such a massive discount on that type of a player I'm going in what do you, what can go wrong Jason do you have any concerns about um or like how how do you respond I have to the, great concerns well the Corey Davis Garrett Wilson involvement obviously those guys weren't on the field last year for for at least some of, of this run for Elijah Moore. Do you just think talent's going to win out in a T. Higgins sort of situation? And, you know, I think there's an argument to be made. Joe Flacco, a quarterback, might yeah, be an upgrade. better as a passer, I think for that, Elijah Moore. As a passer, I think it's an upgrade right this second for this team. It's not an upgrade for the team's future and their outlook as, as an organization. But uh, getting off to a hot start, I think that Flacco would help uh, Elijah Moore. And Elijah Moore's talent given the fact that Garrett Wilson is a rookie and Corey Davis is just a, you know, is a solid wide receiver three. I, I like, a, I like betting on the talent and the upside and what we saw in a, in a short stretch when it doesn't cost you much in your fantasy draft. I, I, my only worry about the Jets quarterback situation right now is 
Like Joe Flacco, if you could tell me Joe Flacco gets three seconds to stand there and then find somebody and pass it, he's ten times the current quarterback Zach Wilson is. My concern is he's a statue. Yep. And they, I mean, it, you you read the camp reports. Those uh, boots on the ground watching Zach Wilson, who's very evasive, yes. who can get out of the pocket, swallowed up on every play, swallowed up on every. It's like Joe Flacco. You better have like a battalion in front of him to give him a chance to do the things that he's probably still capable of doing with his arm. But you get you got a little Carson Palmer situation sure. there in New York that you fix that up, that offensive line gives him some time, I'd feel so much safer about a consistent start of Moore or Corey Davis or any of those players. He should play barefoot. You know, his, his <laughs> legs are too heavy. Those shoes are weighing <laughs> oh, him down. Oh, you think it's the he's wearing steel-toed uh, yeah, cleats? Yeah, I think, I think he's got too heavy a shoes. I never have heard that theory with these uh, cement – Mixer uh, quarterback. Yeah. Last year, the Jets, I mean, heavy, heavy target utilization to the wide receiver position. The the Zach Wilson individual numbers of him targeting running backs was was very low, was 15% or so, uh, which would rank among the bottom. So, that like, concerns for Brees Hall, that is one of mine, is, is Zach Wilson the type of quarterback who is so elusive and scrambling that he feels like he can hit the big play and doesn't take the check down? Uh, which I mean, that's more targets for the for the wide receiver position, uh, it, and so even even if it's Flacco, if it's Zach Wilson, I'm going to bet on the talent that I saw of Elijah sure. Moore breaking through, especially in the eighth round. Not an expensive bet, yeah. All right, give me a one sentence bonus breakout pick, Jason. I'm going with Rashad Bateman. Because he is a second second year wide receiver, second year wide receiver coming into enormous opportunity with a former MVP at quarterback. Pretty solid case, Mike. Uh, I'm going to go with Cole Komet, very late round tight end that should see more than twenty percent of the targets. All right, I'm going to go with Chris Olave, wide receiver for the New Orleans Saints. I think at the end of the year we'll be saying, "Oh yeah, he's the clear cut yep. number one. He was my favorite." collegiate wide receiver to watch work out there in the secondary. Don't mind it. Let's do some mailbag. 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 Ooh, yeah. All right, Kalen in Zeeland, uh, Michigan. Hello. That's not the new one? I was it's I was old, ready to bonjour it. But it's old Zeeland. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, should I keep T. Higgins in the sixth or Antonio Gibson in the seventh round? T. Higgins. For sure. Instagram question, is drafting Kyler Murray in the seventh round too early? No. It's usually too late if you're just saying my ADP. Hope he gets there. We have not discussed Cliff Kingsbury handing play calling duties oh, to Kyler Murray in the I preseason. Love I love it. Uh, one of my biggest concerns for Kyler Murray throughout the course of his career is it seems like he relies more on his physical tools than the actual play or the, the coaching decisions. And I had all of those thoughts. Then you have, uh, what study gate where the, yeah, where they have the, to the, bake in some study the, time. Yeah, the clause was written into his, uh, contract. You have to have these dedicated hours and it, cause you have the quotes of Kyler Murray being like, well, I just kind of go out there and ball. That's, I mean, I'm, that's not the exact quote, but it was the a quote cent is I don't sit there for 24 hours and break down this team and that team yeah. and watch every game because in my head I see so much. Yeah. Okay. I, that's ooh. that's a that, I mean that quote is I have always been successful, yeah. therefore I will always be successful. Yes. So my concern for him has been like get dig into the offense. I'm going to use that for fantasy analysis. <laughs> yeah. I am going to the well with that. I see so much in my head, guys. That so is the, the worst quote imaginable. The fact that you're on the side, sure, seeing everything happen, getting to really call the plays. Like the the best quarterbacks in the league are the ones who are at the line of scrimmage, mm -hmm. taking over the offense because they know it so well and they know what's going to work. Well, my biggest concern for Kyler has been Cliff. So the less you get <laughs> Cliff doing, <laughs> the better. Yeah. Uh, all right. Here's a question from Instagram. Uh, Corey writes in, "How does your board change if your league is standard and not PPR? Well, I would say the biggest shift is between which positions to take. Uh, in a standard league versus a PPR, running backs are going to be so much more valuable than wide receivers. When you're talking about the, um, you know, 
12 through 24, the second uh, players, the flex options, those are, those are going to be running backs outscoring wide receivers that are those middle-tier wide receivers. Uh, you know, within each position, there's a couple of guys that are more touchdown dependent and less volume. That's going to be better, but I would say the biggest change is just taking running backs over wide receivers in similar tiers. Agreed. Instagram question from Imco8 says, what Colts wide receiver other than Michael Pittman has a shot we built this city. to be great for fantasy? I'll let you guys talk about I think it's Mr. The, France over there. Paris uh, Campbell? Yeah. No, I mean, the uh, awful tower is not necessarily who I'm going to go oh, yes! to the well with I, why I, you gotta do him like I that? Awful you know, tower. Why you gotta do him yes! like that? I didn't oh. want to. It was like pun versus belief. I just I didn't know what to go with. I actually like Paris Campbell, but Alec Pierce is the answer. I'm gonna go with youth, upside, physicality, not injury history. Um, kind of more of a jack of all trades, Curtis Samuel type of player. Paris Campbell's career <laughs> being stolen from all of us is a travesty. Uh, it is a travesty. Many a career have been stolen in I such know. ways. I know. Yes. Be my favorite nickname of all time. I've, I'm sorry because I know Jason will never not use oh, that. A lot of people, when they see the Eiffel Tower, they say, oh, I didn't know it was that small. And then this, so this fits with the Eiffel oh, Tower. It's like, no. oh, a little, little uh, guy. Are you guys, do you guys agree it's Alec Pierce? Yes, that would be my answer for sure. I mean, it, yeah, probably. If, if you are a hardcore fantasy football degenerate, who plays in a ton of dynasty leagues, and you were with us the entire offseason and pre-NFL draft, Alec Pierce doesn't get enough buzz because he didn't prior to the NFL draft. He wasn't one of these guys that was touted as like, oh, he's going to be a first or second round pick. No, he just showed up in the second round. But he was a second round pick, so we got to change the presuppositions and the, uh, you know, don't have confirmation bias. This team invested highly in him. Which, if you listen to how Frank Reich talks about him, so similar to when they drafted Michael Pittman. Because mm -hmm. Pittman was a second rounder, too. Yeah, he was. And I, it was like they went up and they got Pittman and he, what they believed they could scout. They took and Pittman before Taylor, right? They did, yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, to me, it was it's a very similar language they use around Alec Pierce. They clearly need him. That would be the other case, right? You guys have made a lot of um, pro Matt Ryan arguments this offseason. Yep. Or at least leaning toward. Matt Ryan greater than Carson Wentz. Thank you. Those Wentz. arguments. Which is really, I mean, that's 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 a low bar. Yeah, it's it's it, it doesn't really share how I feel about Matt Ryan because I think he's good. To say someone's better than Carson Wentz at the quarterback position, they could still be bad, is not saying a lot. Yeah. All right, uh, that's going to do it for today's show. We're going to be not good. back with <laughs> sleepers. Uh, a reminder: ultimatedraftkit.com. All of our tier-based rankings, premium stat projections, hundred plus video player profiles, the brand new custom cheat sheet creator. Uh, we got custom player markings so you can follow along in your draft. We have sleepers, breakouts, busts, and values that we all agree on inside the ultimate draft kit. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you, Al. For the people. Yeah, I'm not, you know. Yeah, this is what they want. That's when you hope they're listening on a lower fidelity system somehow. All right, that is going to do it. Check that out at ultimatedraftkit.com. We'll be back with Sleeper Picks tomorrow. It was a good show, guys. You did, you did a great job today. Oh, you did too, Andy. Thank You're you. You're looking very handsome. Oh, well, you know. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com. And follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. <laughs>